And then on the sides, like wrapped around is these MPN devices. It's usually silicon, germanium, and other alloys that allow, uh, they, they allow this uh, current to flow through once you apply heat. As you see here in the picture, the back part of it, it looks like a kind of a canyon coming out. That is a reactive thermal generator. This is where I work. I work in the reactive materials area at 277. We, con we construct this high temperature module uh, uh, here at 277. It's basically, we fuse silicon germanium at a high temperature and high pressure until we create this pallet. So this pallet, when you apply a temperature difference, they can generate a flow of electrons. So we do what we do, we stack so many of them that we can generate up to 400 watts. This is the current, uh, this is the project I'm currently working on. This machine is from the 1950s, somewhere around there. This equipment was actually used to test the Voyager 1 mission. The last test they run, it was in 1988. So my job was, they basically told me, we have this apparatus, we don't know how it works. Just figure it out, make it better, try to improve it. So I went on it, take all the wires apart, find out how it works, make schematics for it. Then I make a fixture to mount some high resolution stepper motors. So we basically scan a thermocouple sample every 10 microns. And with that, it can give us an idea of how it's the material distribution of the entire, the entire pallet. It's a new testing. This, this is a new method. It hasn't, tried, it hasn't been tried yet in the world. So what, what we're doing is trying to compare how efficient the, the process is by doing contact resistivity. So it, it's, it, this is sort of a mechanical, electrical, you know, software project. It, it's all in one. This is me rewiring it, just having fun. Uh, do you guys know who this guy is? It's uh, this is the guy that makes Seven Minutes of Terror the video. We we met here, Jim. The guy. Other place I work, I have worked at LIGO. It's a laser interferometer gravity observatory. So each each arm, as you guys see in the picture, is two kilo, two kilometers long. It, it's a huge lab. I, I went there in 2010 to work on the fiber optic network. Basically, I replaced entire wiring for data acquisition and replaced it with fiber optics. This is just to give you an idea how big it is. You have a truck right here, and then you have all these huge pipes extending two kilometers right in the middle of the desert, right next to the Manhattan Project in the most radioactive city of the United States. This is me. I made a presentation over in 2010 as far as how we interconnected this fiber optics and the modules we used to digitize it. It was it was a good experience. I mean, my design is currently it's going to currently be installed in LIGO Washington, LIGO Louisiana, and LIGO Germany. I've also been at Kennedy Space Center. I am an undergraduate research scholar, student leader for the Texas chapter. So I represent the student leaders at working for our university at NASA in South Texas. So we get to go up here and meet extraordinary people and astronauts. And we have a conversation with them and they, they sort of try to guide us in the wrong, in the right direction to speak about NASA and encourage other students to come into the NASA field. This is a so famous crusher where they transfer the space shuttle. The thing is huge. That is me. Uh, last time I went, we visited one of the SLS uh, trailer missions. That's me and Frank Tobias. You might you might have seen him there. You see. 
this is uh, Dr. Calvin Mackey. If you guys ever seen uh, Eight Mile, Papa Doc, this is his brother. For the Inception, that's his brother. He's a famous entrepreneur. He uh, developed the to create biodiesel out of grease from restaurants. He's a millionaire now. This is uh, Lil Melvin, an astronaut I got to meet at the Kennedy Space Center. It was an awesome experience. This is the group of astronomers who I work at UTV. We are uh, amateur astronomers. We do gravitational wave research, uh, mostly uh, optophotometry. Basically, we just take a picture of a, of a known star, and we image process that image, and we can determine whether or not the star has a planet. Doppler effect. This is where I work. This is called Nunco Bueno Observatory. It's one of the largest observatories in the nation. There's, there's, there's a handful that are distributed across the United States. So this is kind of what I do. Fast cars and that's my passion. Here's me working on the antenna network for the GPS. This is about 25 meters high. So I get to, I get to build hardware and code software to install it in this observatory so I can automate it. Basically, right now, I'm able to control this entire observatory from my cell phone. I can command it to go to any specific location and take a picture at any given time, at any given moment, as long as I have internet connection. This is me working on some here are mechanics that can control the shutter, the roof. We have a DC motor up in the roof that controls the motion of the shutter. So something went wrong with it, and I went up and fixed it. That's my everyday life with it. So it's cool. This is an article. My my seen these in uh, UTV's website. This article was made about the automation of the current telescope that we have, and the second project we're working on in Argentina. It's called Toros Project means transient robotic observatory of the south. We build an observatory at 13,000 feet above sea level in the Atacama Desert. Uh, and the mirror is 1.2 meters wide. So we expect to, we're searching for kilonovas. It's a supernova, but a thousand times bigger than a supernova. That's why it's called a kilonova. That's where my system comes in place. So right now I'm testing it. I'm making sure that I get all the bugs out of it. And once it's refined, I can take the system, take it to Argentina, the uh, the Atacama Desert, and just build it from scratch over there. Just you know, and once I know once I know it works, I can put it on there, and we can manipulate this over the net. Instead of going 13,000 feet above sea level with an oxygen tank, just take pictures in minus 10 degrees Celsius weather. So it's really hard. When I'm not doing, when I'm not doing missions, I'm doing outreach. As you see, I enjoy to smash things around. This is a friend of mine. We we do something called a physics, where we try to teach the community about science and basically physics in general. If I'm not in outreach, I'm usually having a good time with my friends, riding a motorcycle, playing some pool. This is another, I like sport bikes, so this is what I drive most of the time. If not, I'm doing anything kind of crazy. I'm a adrenaline junkie. I like to, uh, I like to live dangerous, as they say. <laughs> what I do, uh, currently with my friend, we, we have a small business. Uh, basically, I have supernatural design. So we build, you know, a sort of a, uh, Take fancy cars for people who can afford it. It's not your average car. It's, it's it's a fully custom car. Usually they're they're muscle cars, and we re-engineer them with. I make custom software and hardware for them. So basically, a customer just comes in, just comes in and say, "Hey, I want this 1969 Charger. I want 500 horsepower on it. Uh, how much?" And we build it for the guy, and we integrated new technologies, so that the customer have a great experience with it. Yes, this is kind of describes it. Describes it.
this is the warehouse that we're currently looking at. It's uh, Central Avenue. You guys are free to stop by and see the stuff that we're working on. It's about 40,000 square feet warehouse. The shop is about 60 by 200 feet. It's huge. This is, a, this is the type of work we do. It's a 1950 Chevy with a 2013 Camaro engine, full, fully electric, fuel injector control. We try to encourage it about, I mean, this, this, serve, this serves everybody. I mean, not everybody can afford a luxury car. But the ones they do, we try to reach out to them and bring them in so that we can become a profitable business. The car you see on your left is a 69 Ford Galaxy. We just built this a couple of months ago for a customer of ours. You might have seen this in Brownsville once in a while. You know, feel free to just look around, maybe just stop by the shop and see it. It's a really cool, really cool car that we built. That's me, being silly, driving a car, repairing some, some, some wiring. This is the actual car. It's, uh, it's got over 500 horsepower. Uh, it has a voice recognition system and biometrics. Um, if I have a video you guys, I, I can show you guys uh, for a project I made. Can, can you play the video, Herberto? Okay, um, so that's sort of the type of work I do. I build custom software for cars. So I, I, I try to enhance the experience of your old 96 uh, car, muscle car, and integrate new technologies with it. I mean, you have all the looks of a classic car, but all the new technologies that are available for you that enhance the experience, the riding experience, the horsepower. What do you guys think about it? Is it cool? So, I mean, that's, that's kind of the work I do. Um, I, I try to... Can you see me now? Okay. So I try to integrate hardware and software to enha enhance this uh, customer experience. So that, yes, you can have an old car, but with all these new technologies that are available, voice recognition, fingerprint, uh, more steady suspension, higher grade, greater horsepower, and we're even thinking of moving into building hybrid at the time, like integrating a 69 car and build a hybrid engine for it. So I'm um, going to do. Let me let me now talk about how did I get. I mean, it wasn't I was that. I was that old scientist. So you know, just let, let me share. Let me take five, fifteen minutes uh, away from your time and just share my experience with you guys. I am born. I'm a son of two illegal immigrants in the United States. Uh, they're typical immigrants, Jose and Yolanda. You know, they were here with plantations. So. I was both me and my twin brother. But when I was two, they decided to go back into Mexico because they were afraid that maybe the government, if they get deported, maybe they will, they will separate us and they are probably end up in a foster home. So they didn't want that. So they went back to Mexico. Their race, uh, Mexican, via Mexico. Uh, I grew up in there. I make friends. Uh, I used to play with them in the streets, uh, playing before. You know, the, the, the sky was blue. 
There were rainbows everywhere. I, I had a good time. I couldn't complain. Up until uh, December, of March 31st, 1999, I was a 13-year-old kid. We were coming from Samana Santa. So my driver and a, a friend of the family needed to move the furniture out of the house because they were moving. So my dad um, this person uh, to give a hand to them. So my brother and my two sisters went out, went there to help. They were moving out the furniture. They, they, they drive the truck inside of the house, loaded with furniture. So and everything was fine. I'm, I'm going to share this. Uh, some people might find disturbing it, disturbing, but just, just bear with me. So they're, they're fixing, they're helping this person loading the furniture, moving out of the house. At the time, we were learning how to drive. We were 13, and my dad was teaching us how to drive an 18 wheeler. So he asked, brother, go ahead and turn on the car and you know, take it outside. So my brother goes up. Uh, turns on the car. For some reason, I haven't yet to understand. This thing turned on and just took off in reverse. So my dad, what he tried to do is just run to the car to stop it. My little sister was who was five at the time. Maybe thought it was some sort of a game, so she ran like right next to my dad. So this truck hit the cement pole, and the cement pole breaks, falls down and hit my sister in the head. She she died immediately at supper, luckily. So this is gonna happen, she died. We we have to bury her. So then the police show up that, that same day asking for my brother and because he was an unintentional manslaughter. So they wanted to put my brother in a juvenile for five years five years until I was 18, and then for another five years in, in prison. So we didn't have, didn't have time to grieve at the time. And there was the police asking you know, my brother to be put in jail just because this happened. So what we did is we grabbed our belongings that same night. And we ran away from the city, leaving friends and family behind, food on the table. So I ended up myself being on the, I ended up in Matamoros, in the frontier of Mexico and U.S. Because our plan was maybe at some point migrate to the United States again. So I ended up in Matamoros. I was there. I was this 13-year-old kid who thought everything was fine. Uh, you know, nobody dies ever in the world. Uh, the sky's pink, and rainbows everywhere, and gold ponds in the, in the other side of the rainbow. But it turns out that it wasn't, and and I have to be mature enough, and didn't even have time to grieve or shed a tear. So I had to do what was right at the time. We didn't even have a place to sleep. We used to sleep in a van most of the time. And so I went out looking for jobs. I couldn't find any. I mean, I was a car and a uh, grown, grown man job at 13. So I started work, and every money I make, I take it back to my family so that we can stay. So this happened for two years until we got a small little house where we can sleep in. So when I was 15, I decided, well, I'm a United Let me go try my luck maybe in the United States. Maybe, maybe I, I get better luck. So I crossed out my social security, social security card, my birth certificate, and cross over to the United States. So there I was, I find myself again, 15 years old, in a new country. I didn't know English at the time. But to me, it was America. The land of the dream. The, the streets were paving gold, homo, the space shuttle, and the cheeseburger. I mean, no matter what would happen, I'll be fine. So I was there. I was homeless for a period of time. So I would, but the only thing I knew there was, well, I knew how to do mechanics. You teach me how to do mechanics. So I went and asked around all the shops in Brownsville for a job. 
So there was a 15 year old kid asking for an old man job. It was, it was hard. I didn't really even want to give me a chance in the first place. Up until I met Karina, a good friend of mine now. So we met, and I told him, "Say, can you give me a chance? I just need, I just need a job, and I can work for you. Just in return, all that I ask is that you allow me to stay in the shop. I won't steal anything. I won't, I won't take anything from you. Just, I just need a place to sleep and some money just for a burrito, and I'll be fine." So he did. He gave me a chance. I started working there for about a year or so until I got myself back on my feet and rented an apartment. And once I had an apartment, I'd bring my brother over with me because now I had a place to live. And he could. So whatever money I made, I sent it back to my parents in Mexico so that they could sustain themselves. I mean, not only was I working, everybody else was working, but we all were trying to make it at the time. So there was... Uh, Mechanics, you know, fixing cars just to make a living. When I was 17, I decided that I was stable enough to enroll in high school. So I, I went to high school, I, I enrolled. I, by the time I had already an apartment and some food to eat, so the basic necessities were not a problem anymore. So then I had time to go into science because you can't do science with an empty stomach. It just doesn't happen. You're not thinking about Newtonian physics when you haven't had anything to eat. So I um, there I met Heriberto. Turns out the mother uh, had to present a project for a science fair. So he built a wireless microscope, which I helped build. So he and he and Heriberto, they were both they were they went to compete at San Antonio for a science fair. Heriberto was doing some robotics. Uh, my brother was just presenting a project that he had to do just to make an A, trying to get by the class. So there I met this guy who's doing robotics on his garage, out of Home Depot cars or whatever he can. And I was like, wow, I wish I wish I had the time and the money or just the basic necessities to build robots as he do. But I couldn't. I mean, I didn't. Even though I love science and robots and all these nice things, you just can't do it because you have to pay the bills. And the rent is due and there's no food in the refrigerator. So you need to take care of that first before you even step out and say, yes, I'm going to build a robot. So in a way, I kind of sort of envy him at the time because there he was with his family, put in shelter, and just building robots, just doing something that he liked. And I couldn't do it at the time. Because in a way, sort of my childhood was taken away from me. So time passed by. Um, I graduated from high school. I I go for General Motors. I became a master technician there. I was 23 at the time. So then I said, well, you know, now I'm at the point where I can go back to college and really be an engineer. That's what I want to be. I've always wanted to be an engineer. I just never had a chance to be. To do it in the first place. So I go back to college and enroll for school. Uh, I started with algebra. I, I was getting F's and D's because at the time they had offered me the manager position on my place at General Motors. So I wanted to fulfill my job necessities and I was putting school behind. So I was falling behind. I failed my classes. I didn't show finals. Things were horrible. So then I was like, well, maybe if they, I didn't have to do this, maybe if I didn't have to work so much and pay the bills, maybe I was I will be able to go to school full time. So I met uh, Mohammed. He was a computer science at UTV. So he told me he had somebody that, that I can speak to that maybe they can give me a scholarship or some sort of a small job that I can pay for my tuition. So I went in and talked to this guy uh, up on the university and say, well, I'm working, but I'm only working because I have to work, not because I want to buy nice, nice things. But I really want to be a scientist and an engineer. Is there any way you can help me? So, OK, before he even asked me anything, he hands to me a mathematics problem, 
which I hadn't even taken algebra at the time, and my algebra was pretty bad. So I couldn't solve it. And this guy said, well, you see, you can be really good at fixing cars, so, but you know, you're, you don't belong here. We, you, you're not cut to be a scientist. We, we don't play around. We only need a couple of people here. So go back, uh, go back and they fix in cost. That's where you belong. You don't belong here. Don't, don't even waste my time. I don't do charity. So they all went, you know, my hopes and dreams were shattered because there he was, this PhD in physics that was indeed telling me and showing me with evidence that I wasn't cut enough to be a scientist. And I wrote on that. I was like, well, maybe he's right. Maybe I'm just really good at fixing stuff. And the science domain is not for me. So, but then he said, well, I don't do charity, but talk to Dr. Diaz. He, I don't do charity. So I met Dr. Diaz. He asked me for my cell phone. Uh, he's like, well, I'm busy right now, but I'll call you. So I go back to my job, dressed as a mechanic still, my hands squeezed. And just say, well, I mean, this is my life. I'm going to embrace it. I'm not good enough to be a scientist, so I'm just going to do my best here. An hour later, he just called and asked me for an interview. I go back to his office and just, he just asked me, all that he said, just like, tell me your story. So I shared my story with him. He said, well, you remind me of me. I was a mechanic until I was 35. I was married with kids. And I decided to go back because I love this thing. And I struggle with math, but now even it, it's so simple to me because I practice it so much that I master. He does in PGs and general activity. So he gave me a chance. He said, "Well, you're gonna work with me full time. I'm gonna give you some money just to survive, not not to buy fancy stuff. And in return, you do research, and I pay for your tuition. You become." A I just quit your job. So I shook his hand, leave to my job, and quit within the next 15 minutes. The next Monday, I was already studying to become an electrical engineer at UTV. So, I mean, there's been up and downs, but I figure that when you treat life and say, you, anything that you do won't affect me. Or, or you become in a state where none of the stuff that happens matters. You go one to, one to one in life and say, give me your best shot. I'm here. No matter what you do, cut my arms and legs, throw, throw me in the street, I'll make it. So when you are in power with that type of thinking, it's hard that anything will stop you. Because you won't stop when you have a problem and then blame in the universe that your life is so miserable and why does this have to happen to me? No. Instead you say, well, this happened but I'm going to use these as fuel to steer my own future, my own ideas and become my own person. Instead of wasting any time and say, well, my friend drives a Ferrari, I don't know. Or my friends are going to Harvard, I'm not going to Harvard. Or, he just bought a new car, and I'm just here trying to trying to eat tomorrow. So that type of power should do anything. And the notion of I'm not gonna do thermodynamics or complex differential calculus because it's hard, it matters. And being that anybody can throw at you will stop you, and you become a titan. And yes, you might, you may or may not be. Uh, a top, well-respected person in your field. That, that depends on you, but but with that type of mentality, nothing will stop you. So, you know, me, Eriberto, and Javier, what we try to do is we try to encourage you guys to pursue your dreams and allow anything else to inflict it. So don't let anything else change that. So if we could change you guys' life just in a bit, just for the better, we would have fulfill or a dream. And I think maybe if we would have had uh, Javier back in the day, maybe things would have been different. Maybe he wouldn't be building robots out of plastic and
maybe I wouldn't be desiring just to build robots. If there was somebody there to say, hey, come to us, we'll teach you this, we'll, you know, you'll learn it, you can become a scientist, you can do anything that you want. If, she, if, if there was somebody like that at the time they were growing up, perhaps things would have been different. But now you're in this place and you guys are top of your class. You're learning to be scientists and industries. So use these and learn it and master it. So that one become better and happy and inspire the next generation of kids. I think that's that's our only motivation. And, and with, it's, it is the, with this type of thinking that you're gonna get very far in life. Um, it's it is because of this that I'm here at NASA. I have a job and things are really going well. So, live long and prosper. Thank you, guys. See you.